Devi and Namo Buddha to all of you. Uh, we will begin with our uh, traditional Pali chanting. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa so welcome to all of you uh, for our uh, 18th class and uh, we have been studying the book two of the Buddha and his Dhamma and uh, of the uh, book two we have gone through uh, four parts already and today we are going to look at the fifth part of the uh, book two of the Buddha and his Dhamma. And as we have seen that the aim of Baba Sahib Ambedkar in this uh, book too is to show that how the Buddha convinced and campaigned uh, among uh, the diversity of the population and he convinced the people from various, various backgrounds and he convinced people from all sorts of social locations from the rich people to the poor people, from the kings to the uh, uh, the religious uh, teachers of that time, the philosophers. And uh, I think that's uh, that's an indication of how the Buddha's Dhamma was spread among the diversity of the population. So that was basically Baba Sahib's uh, uh, aim to show in this, in this uh, book too, that the Buddhism is accessible and uh, is important for everybody. So today we are, when we are looking at part five, which is uh, titled as Campaign for Conversion Resumed, because we have seen that so far Buddha had been uh, teaching in the city of Kapilvastu among his uh, brethren. He was, he has um, campaigned in, in the city of uh, Kapilvastu among the Shakyas. And uh, we know that uh, the royal Shakyas have uh, accepted the Buddha's teachings and they renowned their homes, including the uh, king that time. The Sakya king Bhadiya also renowned his home and he became homeless and uh, followed the Buddha. About the Shakyas, uh, it is said that in the history, they were very uh, cultured people and uh, the Sakyans had spread not only in the kingdom of uh, uh, Sakyas, whose, whose capital was Kapilavastu. And as the name Kapilavastu indicates, it was a city found... Uh, in the name of uh, the great uh, Sankhya philosopher Kapila and the uh, originator of uh, Sakyans uh, was considered to be Ikshvasu Bakshu that we have seen in the beginning of the Buddhism and he was a very great man and his name was popular uh, right across the present day Pakistan and also Sakyans were not the petite sort of a tribe or uh, a culture or race of people they were very advanced and the six members of the royal family and the seventh was Upali, they, they became the bhikshus. And after converting them, Buddha resumed his campaign for conversion. And that's what we are going to uh, uh, look at today. Uh, as always, that uh, every single line is important for us and it communicates something to us. And we have to bear in mind when we read the Buddha and the Dhamma, that we have to read deeply and from our heart. So the subtitles of uh, the book, uh, the part five are one, conversion of rustic Brahmins and two, conversion of the Brahmins of Uttaravati. So according to some sources, a lot of Brahmins joined uh, the uh, Buddha Sangha. And uh, here in these uh, two sections, we get a glimpse of what kind of a society there was. So I, I have decided not to read uh, this section at large, but uh, going to pinpoint to you something that are very important and essential for us. The title itself, Conversion of Rustic Brahmins. So Rustics means rural, the village villagers. And um, in the ancient India, there were villages of the of the of the of the various people. And as the name indicates, that these uh, Brahmins were li uh, living in some sort of a village. Sociologically, if we see, there were uh, a group of people called Dasa Kammakars and Gahapatis. And the Gahapatis and this Kammakar, the artisans, didn't fall in any of the 
so called varna system and there are now a lot of studies which shows that the society uh, in the in the uh, what we can say uh, uh, in the sakya kingdom or in the gangetic plain that time was not stratified in a sense the way it has been told to us and uh, of course uh, ashoka came from the from the race of nagas and uh, the nagas were the first people who built a huge sort of a kingdom empires in this country uh, shunag and in uh, all the mauryans and so on and so forth so uh, what we are going to look at is a little bit of a sociology of the time so here you know in this very first uh, verse of the of the section is very clear that the buddha was dwelling in gridhakut mountain in near rajagriha now anybody who has gone to rajagir today and it's a very beautiful place i have been there a few times and there are five hills surrounding the city and the city was very flourishing the city of rajagir was very flourishing city that time and um, king bimbisar was the ruler of that and we know that it's a very it was a very populous city and there were a lot of ascetics there were a lot of spiritual practitioners around the the city is there were jainas there were the buddhist there were other uh, philosophers you know living in the city of rajagir near rajagir because it was surrounded by five hills and one of the hills was gridhakut because it's 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 um, it's peak of the of that mountain looked like a vulture which is about to take a flight and uh, this gridhakut is uh, the place the buddha had a cave there even it exists today and it disciples uh, disciples like alan ananda mahakash uh, sariputra mogla and they all lived together there on the top of the mountain and the top of the mountain if you go there where the buddha used to sit in the evening you can see a very beautiful view of the forest and the mountains so very beautiful place and uh, so buddha is uh, sitting uh, he is back in the gridhakut mountain which was his uh, one of the very favorite spots where he liked to dwell and uh, this mountain is also very famous for the mahayana buddhist because according to the mahayana tradition the uh, great scriptures like lotus sutra and uh, diamond sutra were expounded at the, the gridhakut so it is it is a very holy mountain in a sense where the buddha lived for a long time and practiced and his his disciples lived this is where devadatta tried to attack the buddha so the setting is very uh, nice so when buddha was in the gridhakut mountain near rajagriha there was a village now you uh, look at this word village of some 70 or so families all of them brahmins so people used to live together in the village there were 70 families of the brahmins who were living in a village near rajagir so see the uh, buddha will go in the morning in the city of rajagir for begging his arms and he will go different places because that was a tradition of the buddha buddha will not go to the same place again and again he will not ex- he will not approach the same families again and again so as a rule the buddha went to the different people and uh, he he wanted to convert these people the the brahmins of a certain village and uh, he went to them and he sat down under a tree so that was a tradition of the buddha and to sit down under a tree or some location so that people will flock around him now what happens with the verse number 3 the people seeing the dignity of his presence and the glorious appearance of his body flocked around him on which he asked the brahmins how long they had dwelt in the mountain there and what their occupation was so this is what you you start your conversation with generally how this is how you start your conversation with so likewise buddha started you know asking them the questions about their whereabouts how long they have been dwelling in these mountains and what was their occupation now these questions are very important because uh, as a farmers the the brahmins at that time were not the only the purohits or whatever they are that is what is being told to us today but they used to have the occupations okay and as i told you this was a part of india where the caste system was not very strong that time it was not you know you know there were there were some brahmin villages here and there but it's not that you know the rajgir was like you know the city of uh, the varna and caste it was not like that at all so to this they replied we have dwelt here during 30 generations because at that time you talk in terms of the generations okay you didn't talk in terms of uh, like uh, 
you know, the years like that. They said that they have been living there for past 30 generations and our occupation is to tend cattle. Very significant answer because what were they doing? They were the, uh, they were tending their cattle. So their occupation was, you know, in the today's uh, parallels, we, we call them that their occupation was that of in the Hindi language or Marathi language, Gauri. They were the Gauris. Okay. On asking further as to the religious belief, they said, so Buddha asked them, what do you believe in? What's your religious belief? So they said that we pay homage and sacrifice to the sun and the moon. So that's what we do. We pay our homage to the sun and the moon. In, in, in short, we worship sun and moon, the rain and fire according to the several seasons. So actually they were the worship of the nature. You know, they were like uh, uh, the people who believed in the worship of nature and they worship nature. That is what is uh, they told to the Buddha. And they further said, if one of us dies, we assemble and pray that he may be born in the heaven of Brahma and so escape further transmigrations. Now this theme that uh, people wanted to unite with the Brahma, they wanted to Brahma, get birth in the Brahma Lok or any celestial abode was prominent at that time and uh, you know they thought that this is the way to escape the transmigration. This theme of the Brahmins wanted to enter into the realm of the Brahma and uh, enter into Brahma Lok and also that uh, they would like to escape the sansara, the transmigration, the cycle of birth and death was a very dominant theme among the Brahmins of the time and even today it has, it's a dominant, you know, sort of a theme. And elsewhere also the Buddha has talked about how you cannot unite with the Brahma and, uh, you know, he has said that, you know, um, very interesting sort of uh, uh, discussions on this theme, particularly in Devija Sutta, there is a very interesting discussion between the Brahmins and the Buddha, where Buddha tells them what is the proper way to, the, to go to the celestial abode. And as we know that... Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the flip of the terms, like sometimes the Buddha used the same terms, but he flipped them, you know, so that, so for example, there was like this Brahma Lok. So Buddha had this very beautiful concept of the dwelling, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the, in the highest uh, abode as Brahma Vihar, Char Brahma Vihar, we see four um, Brahma Viharas, and we know that, you know, they are altogether different from so-called Brahma Lok. They, they, there is a Maitri, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Ofeka. They are traditionally called the Brahma Vihar. Sometimes, you know, the Buddha had to use that, uh, you know, the popular words at that time and give them a very different spin altogether. So, for example, if people wanted to say that we want to go to the highest uh, abode of the Brahma, Buddha said that, uh, no, the highest abode is here only if you practice Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Ofeka. So, for the, to go to the Param Lok, or the uh, highest sphere, and, and ultimately Buddha said that, you know, we have to transcend all these look, all these realms. So according to the Buddhist psychology and Buddhist philosophy, the, uh, when you, when you attain to enlightenment, when you understand the reality, you become Lokuttar. So there are Lokya realities and there is a Lokuttar. So Buddha dwells beyond the, you know, realms of, uh, experiences, you know, uh, that's, I'm trying to put it very simply, but we can understand, you know, what I'm trying to get it at is, uh, you know, how to understand the words that come in Buddhism in a context. So there was a social context where people talking about the highest dwelling as uniting with the, with the Brahma. Buddha was saying that, no, that's not the way to go forward. The way to go forward is to cultivate the unbound Maitri within you. So if anyone cultivates unbound Maitri within themselves, they are already in the highest sphere of existence. If our, if, if our minds are full of compassion, we are already in the highest place in the universe, I would say. You know, there is no other place when you are even when your mind is boundlessly free to love all, to cherish all. So uh, the Buddha replied, he said that that is not a safe way, not by it can you benefit. The true way is to follow me. Now, uh, when, we, when the Buddha says, follow me, means he says that, you know, pay heed to my words. You don't have to accept them. You don't have to, you know, take them at their face value. 
you have to examine them you have to you have to study them you have to practice them and then only you have to accept my teaching that's what the buddha would you know tell all the time so but for for for, for a certain time we have to follow what the buddha says to know whether you know what he, what he, what he is saying or teaching makes sense so buddha is not somebody who is ask you to blindly follow him he would ask you to test his words like a gold goldsmith will uh, test the gold whether it's pure or not whether it's a, it's a mixed or whether it's it's a corrupted form or whether it's a different matter altogether so buddha says very firmly to the brahmin this is not a safe way not by it can you benefit the true way is to follow me because true ascetics and practice complete self composer with the view to obtain nirvana so according to the buddha the self composer is very important so for any dwelling at the highest abode it begins with the self composer and that's what the buddha is teaching this uh, uh, brahmins from the village as to they have the self composer with a view to obtain nirvana and then he added these lines and verse number 8 please pay attention this is very interesting uh, words they who consider truth as that which is untrue it's it's also this words also comes in the dhammapad about sar means th- uh, truth but it's it's quoted in english here and maybe we can look at it at some point of time the pali equivalent of it so they who consider truth as that which is untrue and regard that which is untrue as truth this is but to adopt heretical opinions and can never lead to true advantage now see this uh, uh, there was a complete uh, debate in the ancient india and the buddha and the buddhist were called the heretics they were called the heretics and the brahmins used to you know proud themselves as the people of the god and those people who didn't believe in the god they were called the heretics the you know the, the somehow nastika and astika sort of thing but that's not so it's it's a, it's the what, he, what the buddha is trying to uh, do here is to you know uh, completely change the vocabulary it's a very interesting that the buddha talks in the language of the people he meets and he gives them a diff- he, he gives a very different spins to the words he goes on elaborating the uh, terms and try to clarify for the people on their own grounds and that's a very interesting sort of a communication strategy of the buddha he is not diverging from what they are saying he is asking them what do you do you know what is your religious practice and they are telling buddha that this is what is their religious practice and buddha is not saying okay you do this or do that buddha is saying okay this is okay but you know this is not the way to reach the highest abode how do you reach the highest abode so the verse number 8 then who consider truth as that which is untrue and regard that which is untrue as truth this is but to adopt heretical opinions and can never lead to true advantage so that's not how you are going to have the true advantage by you know following the way that you are following and he says that everywhere but to know as truth that which is true and to regard as false that which is false this is perfect rectitude and this shall bring to profit now uh, we stop at knowing the truth as truth but uh, the buddha also says uh, here implicitly that we have to know that untruth as untruth so mere knowing truth is is not you know uh, the whole of the path in order to understand the world around us we have to also try to make efforts to understand untruth as untruth what is false we have to understand it's it as a false thing so it's not just about truth because you know you see in the world today people talk about truths people talk about alternate truths people talk about uh, what we can see fake news and so on and so forth so equivalent uh, discussion that we can have today about what the buddha taught to these brahmins from the village near rajagir is that uh, you know it's 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 not just important to know truth as truth but it's also essential and important to know untruth as untruth so he calls the position of the brahmins uh, a heretical position so now about the trans transmigration how to escape from this transmigration of birth and death this is what the buddha says in the word verse number 10 he says everywhere in the world there is death there is no escape from it so however we try to escape from the death the buddha says that there is no escape from the death everywhere it's there 
and in pali buddha says that sabbe satta marana dhamma means every being has to die so you know the the escape from the clutches of life and death that we talk about the sansara and so on and so forth so buddhi when when the buddha uses the word like sansara you know we have to understand it in a context you know he's he's under, he's he's making he's using that word in a particular context so there were the words which were around at the time of the buddha they look similar to the so called uh, uh, different religions of the time but the, what buddha did buddha has turned those words upside down okay so to consider this as a condition of all states of being that there is nothing born but must die as i said that the baba sahab baba sahab ambedkar had this very uh, powerful skill of using the words and the language and that's very much evident in the buddha and the dhamma when we read it when we engage with the buddha and the dhamma we see how baba sahab ambedkar has used the language very skillfully and you know in a way that will make a lot of things easier for us but reading uh, the english text is not easy baba sahab ambedkar himself said that we have to make certain efforts because the language uh, is not that easy to understand but if we unravel the words and the languages we begin to see how deeply baba sahab ambedkar has gone into the things now see this very interesting sentence here to consider this as a condition of all states of being that there is nothing born but must die and therefore to desire to escape birth and death this is to exercise one's self in religious truth so if we if we want to uh, escape the uh, birth and death we have to exercise one's self in religious truth this uh, discussion on religious truth is very interesting that you know we don't we cannot rely on something false we cannot rely on something which is not true we cannot rely on something that is just speculation we cannot rely on something that is something speculative superstitious we have to rely on the truth and the truth as baba sahab ambedkar had said in, in in many different text you know is is is, is exist irrespective of you know our belief system the truth is the truth okay and it exist even if we if we want it to exist or not exist it does exist for example the the the, the truth of impermanence you know it was existing before we were even the human beings came into being the truth of anatta it existed even we came into being you know that everything is dependent on every other things that nothing can arise of its own so these are all truths the religious truths are there so what we have to do we have to live in accordance with the religious truth in other words buddha is saying that we have to live in accordance with the dhamma you know if we have the desire to escape birth and death he says that we cannot escape death because it's there when we are born we are going to die that's very natural for us so verse number 12 the 70 brahmins hearing these words desired at once to become shramanas now you can see that the the the, the people could easily become the shramanas now here baba sahab ambedkar is not saying that you know they desire to become upasaka or they desire to become uh bikkus baba sahab is using the word that they desire to become samana so we know that in the ancient india there were two traditions the brahmans and the shramana and the shramanas were the people who used to work towards way hard towards you know uh, making uh, the world better and realize the religious truth for themselves so they decided to become the shramanas and there is something mystic, uh, mystical here or mythical here and on being welcomed by buddha their hair hair fell off and they presented the appearance of true disciples so the the equivalent words for buddha disciples are like you know upasakas or bhikshus also shramana and many a times buddha is called mahasamana uh, the boss of the shramanas so uh, very interesting this verse number 12 the 70 brahmins hearing these words desired at once to become shramanas and on being welcomed by buddha their hair fell off and they presented the appearance of true disciples now after being you know inspired by the words of the buddha the brahmins decided to go back to their homes and uh, oh, they they all set out to return to the vihara means vihara means they all decided to go to the gridhakut where buddha was 
dwelling. So they, Buddha is teaching them in their village and Buddha had converted them as we can see from this discussion and they decided to go to the Vihar where the Buddha was dwelling. That means uh, in the Gridhakit uh, mountain. But on the way, on the road, certain thoughts about their wives and families troubled them while at the same time a heavy downpour of rain prevented their advance. So it was pouring very heavily when the Brahmins, the 70 Brahmins started leaving for their, for the Vihara. But the thoughts of their family started coming into their minds and it was downpouring, it was raining heavily. So there were some 10 houses on the roadside in which they sought shelter. But on entering one of them, it was soon perceived that through the roof, the rain found its way and there was but little protection from the rain. Now, this is also another verse from the uh, uh, Dhammapad that comes into here. So verse number 15, looking at uh, the, the Brahmins getting weight from the rains because the, the roof was uh, leaking and the Brahmins were getting weight. This is what the Buddha said. And this I said comes in the uh, Dhammapad. This verse also comes in the Dhammapad like the previous verse also comes in the Dhammapad. As when a house roof is not properly secured, then the rain finds a way through it and drops within. So when the thoughts of thoughts are not carefully controlled, the desires in bracket, sexual desires will soon bore through all our good resolutions. But as when a roof is well stopped, when the water cannot leak through, so by controlling one's thoughts and acting with reflection, no such desire can arise or disturb us. So Buddha is here giving the example. Am I audible? Yes. 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 Yes, yes, sir. Yes, because sir. I think Kritika is saying that I'm not audible. So, okay. You are audible. Okay. Clear. Clear and loud. So, uh, uh, what's happening here? Uh, the Buddha is giving the example of 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 a house because that time the roofs were made up of uh, the dried grass or you know the leaves and other stuff. So it was very important for a householder to work on their roofs and make them so strong that the rains will not pour in their houses. And therefore, uh, the Buddha is giving a very, a very profound uh, sort of an image of how even if we have a firm resolution or even if we have a good resolution, but if we do not control our thoughts, if we do not act with reflection, then the sensual desires will start coming into our way. So what Buddha is trying to talk here is that we have to work on our minds in the sense that we have to find the ways to not let our minds go elsewhere. We have to find the ways that uh, we have to make our mind so strong, so firm, so fully controlled. And that is what it is said that uh, you know Buddha still says elsewhere that the controlled mind leads to happiness. The protected mind, the guarded mind leads to happiness. And Buddha also says that no, nothing can harm you as your unguarded, unprotected mind. It is your best friend. You know, the unguarded, unprotected mind is your worst enemy. But if you're guarded and controlled mind, the protected mind is your best friend. It can do a lot of welfare to you. But if the mind is haywire, if the mind is uncontrolled, it can cause us so much damage. Even our enemies cannot cause us so much damage. So this is what the Buddha is saying that even if they have a good resolution that they have decided to become Samana, despite of that, if they don't control their thoughts, if they don't act with reflection, then the desires will continue to arise in their minds and control them. The 70 Brahmins on hearing these lines, although convinced that their desires were reprehensible, yet were not wholly free from doubt, nevertheless, they went forward. They were not yet convinced. In the, in the beginning, they wanted to become Samana, but on their way back to Vihara, they had certain doubts. They were thinking about their families. And when it was raining heavily, Buddha again taught them that, you know, it's not enough to have a good resolution. They have to find a way to control their mind, to protect their mind and act with reflection act with deep thinking. They were not convinced, but they carried on. 
as they advanced, they saw some scented wrapping on the ground, and the Buddha took the opportunity of calling their attention to it. And after this, seeing some fish gut also lying about, he directed the notice to its color, heel order, and then added these lines and said. So now, as they're walking towards the Gridakut, the Vihara, on the way, they found two objects. So one object was the scented wrapping on the ground. So there was something wrapped beautifully in the scent and very beautiful fragrance was going around. And also there was some fish gut, which was smelling very bad, rotten. Uh, fish gut was there. And he directed their notice to its ill order and then added these lines and said. So he found two objects the Buddha, on the way. The Buddha found two objects. One was a very beautifully wrapped object in a scent, which was smelling very beautiful. The fragrance was very beautiful, very good, very soothing, very desirable to the senses, the nose. And on the other hand, they found the uh, fish gut. And fish gut smells very bad. So it was, it was smelling very bad and he directed their notice to its ill order and then added these lines and said, verse number 19, he who concerts with the low and the base contracts the same character as he, one, as he who handles a foul substance. He goes from worse to worse and utterly without reason, he perfects himself in wickedness. So that is what the Buddha has always, always cautioned about, you know, how not to... Uh, you know, uh, get, uh, uh, you know, uh, attached to something which is uh, low and base. He's talking in terms of character. He's talking in terms of uh, people's, uh, 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 when, uh, can somebody help Kritika? Because it seems that she cannot hear. Because she's writing in the chat box that she can't hear. She has some problem with, uh, I think, her mic. Maybe somebody can help her. Okay. So uh, here, uh, what Buddha is, Buddha is uh, uh, saying uh, in, in this uh, particular sense is that we have to always keep up the company of, you know, something high and something noble. So he, he says that the company is very important, that what kind of a company we nourish, which company we dwell in is very important. And, uh, you know, in the, in the Mahamangal Sutta, also Buddha talks about uh, dwelling with the right people. He has talked about the, the best friends, the Kalyan Mitrata and so on and so forth. So here the Buddha is talking in a very interesting sense. He says in the verse number 19, and I'm going to read it again. He who concerts with the low and the base contracts the same character as he who handles a foul substance. He goes from worse to worse and utterly without reason, he perfects himself in wickedness. But the wise man consulting with the wise contract, the same character, even as the scent of a sweet order adheres to him who handles it. Advancing in wisdom, practicing virtue, he goes on to perfection and is satisfied. The 70 Brahmins hearing these words, his verses convinced that their desire to return home and enjoy personal indulge was the indulgence, was the evil tent that adhered to them cast off such thoughts and going forward came to the Vihar and finally obtained the condition of Arhats. Very interesting. And uh, this is how the conversion of the uh, uh, Brahmins who were living in a village near, uh, near, near Gridhakit mountain, that's how the Buddha uh, converted them. So what, what is uh, the beauty of this, uh, this particular uh, section is you know, I would say that it's also skills in communication as to how the Buddha communicated. Because he was the great teacher. He was somebody who can teach so easily. And this is what the Buddha has taught them. You know, he first listened to them very carefully. He, he, he tried to understand their religious practices. And using the same words that they use, he gave them the completely different meaning. And uh, he tried to convince them. Even when they were not convinced, then he, he took the example of what is happening around. So it was raining. It was pouring hard. So Buddha, Buddha used the image of, uh, you know, the ill-thatched house as to if we do not have a properly thatched house, the water will leak at home. And uh, therefore, I think uh, it's very interesting to understand the Buddha's uh, uh, sort of uh, the way to 
uh, teach. So, you know, he found two things lying on the, on the road. One was foul smelling and one was good smelling. And even using that, the Buddha has told them, taught them using those images. So that was the brilliance of the Buddha to teach, able to teach people on their own grounds, uh, in their own uh, situations, in their own understanding. And I, I, I think this is a sort of a, uh, an exercise in communication that we can see here. So uh, also we are going to look at the uh, section number two. And this is also a very interesting uh, sort of uh, section. Part five is all about converting to Brahmins. So he converted the village Brahmins and now he's, he's converting the other branch, other group of Brahmins. So they are the Brahmins from Uttaravati. So once the Buddha was residing in the, in the Jetvan, now he's, this, this setting is now in the Shavasti, in Jetavana. And we know about Jetvan. It was a Jeta's garden and uh, how Anath Pindaka tried to purchase it. We have seen that story. So there were in a country to the eastward called Uttaravati. So there was a small country which is called Uttaravati, small uh, place which is called Uttaravati was there. And there were 500 families, 500 Brahmins. They had agreed to go together to residence of Nirgrantha ascetic on the banks of the Ganges, who by polluting himself with dirt, aspired to the condition of a Rishi. So there was this ascetic whose name was Nirgrantha. And he was dwelling near the Ganges and uh, they decided to go to him and uh, try to understand them, understand the ascetic. And that ascetic has put the dirt all over his body and he was trying to become the Rishi. Now, please understand these words. Huh? No, uh, uh, note the word Rishi here, okay? Because this word is going to come again in this particular conversation. On their way, they were overtaken in the desert with thirst seeing a tree and hoping to find some human habitation near, they hastened to it. But when they arrived there, they found no sign of life. So they were in a desert and uh, they, they, they saw some, some kind of uh, what my rage and they thought there must be water. So they went nearby and they found that there was no water. They were very thirsty. They wanted to drink water, but they didn't find water. So on this, they raised their voices in lamentation. They tried, started crying that there is no water. Suddenly from the tree, they heard the voice of the resident spirit who asked them why they lamented so. And on hearing the reason, supplied them to the full with drink and meat. So there was a resident spirit, you know, some kind of mythological being there. And uh, he listened to their, their, their things and he asked them to listen to their stories, to his story. And upon listening, he offered them drink and meat. So, you know, this, uh, I, I said the words used are very interesting. So the spirit offered the 500 Brahmins drink and meat. So the food offered was the uh, uh, food of meat. You know, it was a non-vegetarian food offered to them. So all the stories of vegetarian and non-vegetarian, you know, unless we understand the ancient Indian history, it's very difficult, you know, to know India as such. The Brahmins ready to start onwards asked the spirit what had been his previous history that he was thus born. On which he explained that having gone to the assembly of priests in Shravasti when Sudatta had bestowed the garden on the Buddha, he had remained all night listening to the law, Dhamma and having filled his drinking cup with water as he went, had bestowed it in charity among the priests. So this is a story where uh, Buddha was uh, teaching uh, in uh, Jetavan and Sudatta. Of course, Sudatta is the name of Anatha Pindaka. So Anatha Pindaka has bestowed the garden to the Buddha and he has remained all night. So there was one night Buddha was giving his discourse all night and there were a lot of monks who were listening to the Buddha that time. And he was somebody who was listening to the Buddha in the dark of night. And he had this uh, drinking cup with water and uh, he, he poured, he gave water to the bhikshus there. So all night he was giving water to the bhikshus there while listening to the Dhamma taught by the Buddha. So this was a setting. So on his return next morning, so next morning that spirit returned to his wife. His wife asked in anger what annoyance he had received that he would stay away all night. He said that, why did you stay away all night? Where were you? On which he replied that he was not annoyed. 
but he had been to listen to the buddha preaching at the jet one jetavana so he said no no i was not having any annoyance i had no problem at all but all night i went to jetavan and i was listening to the buddha on this is why he began roundly to abuse the buddha and said she is why became very angry listening hearing the words of the buddha and uh, she said this gautam is but a mad preacher who deceives the people and so on so she started uh, heaping abuses on the buddha you know calling him a mad preacher deceiver of the people so and so but don't think that the buddha had all the good words when he was alive there were a lot of critics of the buddha a lot of people were abusing the buddha the brahmins at that time they used to call him shudra they used to call him bho gautama means are gautam like that so don't think that you know buddha got all the praises in his life there were people who used to heap their abuses on the buddha so here the wife of uh, that resident spirit said to him this gautama is but a mad preacher who deceives the people and so on so ninth on this he said i resented not her statements but rather submitted to them and so when i came to die i was born as a spirit but on account of my pusillanimity i was confined to this tree and then he recited these verses so he said when my wife was being critical of the buddha i was not resenting resented her statements but i accepted i submitted i didn't utter a word in the praise of the buddha i didn't say anything so when i die i i was born as a spirit but on account of my pusillanimity because i was so fearful that i was confined to this tree and then he recited these verses so verse number 10 sacrifices and such services are sources of misery day and night a continual burden and anxiety so yajna and agas sacrifices means yajna and agas are sources of misery day and night a continual burden and anxiety to escape sorrow and destroy the elements of the body a man should attain to the law of the buddha and arrive at deliverance from all worldly rules of religion world rishis so you see that they were going to see the rishi nirgantha this 500 brahmins were said to go to see the rishi who was living in the bank of the of the of the river ganges and uh, here the resident spirit is telling them that to escape sorrow and destroy the elements of the body a man should attain to law of the buddha the dhamma and arrive at deliverance from all worldly rules of religion so all worldly rishis the rishis we talked about uh, worldly things you know we have to deliver ourselves from them we have to attain to the law of the buddha huh? the brahmins having heard these words resolved themselves to go to shravasti so instead of going to um, uh, the nirgantas uh, nirgantas uh, ashrama they decided to go to shravasti to hear to buddha to the place where the buddha was and having explained the object of their visit the world honored said to them this is what the buddha told them taught them and listen carefully these verses all the man goes naked with tangled hair or though he clothes himself with a few leaves or garment of bark though he covers himself with dirt and sleeps on the stones what use is this in getting rid of impure thoughts so all this ascetism all this uh, self uh, mortification all this uh, you know ways of punishing one's body the buddha is saying that they don't help us to get rid of the impure thoughts although a man goes naked with tangled hair so you know some people thought that if you go naked in the forest you will attain to nirvana so there is one very great teacher in buddhism called saraha uh, and he lived in the 12th century uh, you know nearby that period he said that going naked would have made you attain to nibbana then the lions the deers all these animals living in the forest would have already been awakened so going naked uh, you know it doesn't contribute you, contribute anything to the pure purity of thoughts desire you know or if you cloth yourself with few leaves or garment of bark though he covers himself with dirt so we have, we see in india a lot of people lot of sadhus they cover their bodies with the dirt thinking that they will get rid of the impure thoughts no this is not the way to uh, get rid of the impure thoughts but he who neither contains or kills verse number 14 but he who neither contains or kills one who doesn't fight with others one who doesn't kill 
or destroys by fire because that in in that time the society was wild land people using this uh, uh, fire to burn the houses of the people burn the farms of the people so on and so forth it, it was going on rampant who desires not to get the victory you know we are all the, all the time trying to score points for others this is what we try to do all the time buddha says that this is not the way to purify your mind who is moved by goodwill towards all the world there is no ground in such a case for ill will or hate so he says that if you want to uh, remove the ill will or hate the most essential thing is to develop goodwill towards all the world to sacrifice to spirits in order to find peace merit or after this life expecting reward his happiness is not one quarter of that man who pays homage to the good so the 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 importance of doing good the importance of good thought is so much that even if you if you sacrifice if you if you give if you if you uh, do uh, if you want to gain merits you donate to the temples you give you give whatever it doesn't matter what the buddha says what matters is we pursue good we pay homage to good he who is ever intent on good conduct and due reverence to others who always venerates old age for happy consequences increasingly attain that man beauty and strength and life and peace on hearing this from her husband the wife became reconciled now there is a little editorial mistake here because uh, it is the it is the buddha who is teaching to uh, the uh 500 brahmins who came after meeting nirgantha so this verse number 17 is an editorial mistake so uh, we see that uh, the buddha has says that if you want to have beauty if you want to have strength if you want to have life and peace the best way to have it is to be intent on good to cultivate our minds into maitri metta and so on and so forth so what uh, you know this uh, part five the of the book two the conversion campaign of the buddha and uh, he has given the example two examples of the brahmins from uh, rajagir and the villagers village brahmins from the rajagir and this 500 brahmins who were living in the in the country of uttaravati and how buddha taught them in a very simple language so this this section uh, this part two of the buddha nizam is all about the buddha converting people from different social locations social backgrounds political backgrounds the religious backgrounds so on and so forth and one thing stands very clearly out of this is that the buddha teaches in the language of the people he doesn't impose himself he understand their situation he understand their culture he understand their 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 thoughts he understand the situation around and he brings all these things to his aid to teach people so that they can understand for themselves so here we will stop today and we will uh, open it up for a discussion for next 10 minutes sir uh, i have one doubt in yes yes go on go on yeah in the second in the second one conversion of brahmin of travati in the first verse yeah that the preaching his doctrine for the benefit of man and gods means mm. what what does it mean god is god umesh this uh, question comes all the time and uh, baba sahab ambedkar has explained it uh, very nicely in uh, in the when he he talked about the revolution and counter revolution in these words like deva nagar vindika one minute these words like you know deva naga or mahindika they always come in the in the pali uh, sort of gathas and these words are very important because uh, they do not represent any god or uh, whatever they represent uh, the human community so deva was like a community of the people it was not some kind of uh, the celestial beings or like that similarly the nagas similarly the yakshas the kinnaras so they were all human communities at the time of the buddha so it is not it has nothing to do with any god or like that okay sir thank you
it, it comes there like you know in the in the in the ratan sutta like that it it comes like uh, deva naga mahindika and words like that so we don't have to uh, you know they, they we have to understand that there were communities like that sir you have referred in so many uh, verses uh, regarding dhampada hmm. uh, it means uh, to study this uh, that uh, dhampada is also have to be read simultaneously or, or what what is this yes why not because i think uh, the verses of dhammapad are referred by baba sambedkar uh, very interestingly here in many places and uh, uh, baba sahab ambedkar liked uh, very much this uh, pali dhammapad he was a scholar of pali but at the same time he had this uh, he had this um, i would say appreciation for chinese dhammapad because apparently chinese dhammapad comes up with lot of interesting stories in pali also there are a lot of interesting stories so every verse has a story so for example we have seen this verse that uh, the ill thatched house uh, will lead to leaking of the water similarly uh, like that if we know that uh, this uh, our minds are not fortified if our minds are not controlled if our minds are not protected then the bad thoughts will come ill thoughts will come so this verse is there but we didn't know the context of it so now after reading this section we know how this verse has come into being oh so beautiful thank you sir thank you so all these verses like manopubbangamma damma the first verse has also a story so buddha didn't uh, didn't utter anything without a context so there is a context of every single verse umesh perfect perfect sir okay yeah sadhu sadhu sir thank so, you sir welcome sir this section is full of dhammapad yes yeah in nine, verse number 9 it is the to know the truth and that which is true and to regard as false and that which is mm. this dhammapad i think it, it is saranta sarato atta asaranta asarato yes they saranga digachanti samma sankalpa gochara right very true yeah. yeah you can share that in the group madam that's very yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah that will yeah. be very helpful for us <laughs> and sir for it's also request for you to just suggest that uh, chinese dhampada we have not thought of that chinese dhampada is there <laughs> mm, yes this is there there is everything in china whatever we have in the pali and uh, in sanskrit it's all there in chinese language okay it is just a, a translation or something different translation of, of the time the, in okay. the ancient time they translated and added lot of things and so we we have to look at different sources the way baba sambedkar suggested for uh, uh chinese dhammapad he has a deep appreciation for chinese dhammapad mangesh ji yes sir chinde sir yes sir chinde sir this chinese dhammapad pada hmm. is there any english translation uh, available yes yes, yes there is there is there Can is help us to get it uh, where to get it i will try to find out and uh, we'll send you a link that is very nice of you yes 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 because uh, uh, it is better to understand what uh, they have if it is in depth a little more in elaboration it's it's i heard that it's not just about uh, verses there are uh, stories yeah, yeah yeah and these stories are very interesting because uh, the buddha had used the medium of stories to teach us yeah yeah like i, I yeah. understand this because uh, uh, some professors in the mumbai university they were also telling That mm -hmm. there are stories behind every dhamma pada. Yes, yes, yes. Now that dhamma pada has not taken a birth, they said. Yes, yes. Has to be. That's something happening as well. But so there was the dhamma pada, and the lines were there into that. Yes, yes, yes. So it is better if we can uh, get hold of that kind of thing. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. Thank you very sure. much. Sure, sir. Sure, sure. Anything. any comments or any critical reflections if not then uh, we will end our session uh, here if there is nothing on your mind to share or comment on and uh, we will meet next saturday at 11 o'clock and we will resume our A class on part six. So
Thank you so much all for joining in today. Jai Bhim Namo Buddha. Jai Bhim Jai Bhim. Jai Bhim Jai Bhim Namo Buddha.